Throughout this series, we've looked at our brain, our sleep, our skin, our gut, and so much more. All to find out more about how our body works and what we can do to keep ourselves healthier for longer. Hi, I'm Dinesh Balasingham, and welcome to the final episode of this series of On The Pulse. On today's episode, I'm going to dig deeper into the science of extending our health span. A blood pressure monitor that allows you to keep a close eye on your hypertension and a cardio workout that would make you, well, laugh. We've all heard about lifespan, which is how long we have to live. But what about health span? Well, health span is almost more important because it's about how long we have, not just alive, but healthy. In Singapore, our population is aging rapidly. And the number of those living past their 100th birthday doubled between 2010 and 2020. But as lifespan grows, is our health span growing along with it? That's where the Centre for Healthy Longevity comes in. Established by the National University Health System in 2022, it aims to improve our health span by delaying ageing. Yup, you heard that right. Delaying ageing. It may sound like a fantasy movie, but it's not. And I'm here to find out more. But before that, I had to do my part. I underwent a host of tests, and two weeks prior, I'd given a blood sample. I guess I'll find out what that's all about today. And breaking it down for us is Professor Andrea Meyer. She's an expert on the science of aging and age-related diseases. And she wants to slow down biological aging in individuals between 30 and 75 years of age. The term husband is quite new. Um, lifespan, first of all, is the number of years somebody lives. Um, you have a certain passport, uh, age, and then you know how long you are on Earth. On the other hand, health span is the duration you are living in good health, uh, without age-related diseases and with a good quality of life. And for me, personally, health span is much more important compared to lifespan because we should have a very high quality of life and we should age without age-related diseases. Can you explain to us more in detail the difference between the two? We have to distinguish two terms, that's the chronological age and the biological age. Chronological age is easy because that's what your age mm -hmm. is at this moment in time. However, the biological age is determined of how well your body is aging at this moment in time. It really is a measure for the pace of aging. And a person at a certain age, for example 40, can either be biologically younger or older, so being 35 or 45. Aging starts quite early, uh, and if you really want to go through the origin, yes, it starts at conception, because then our cells divide from that point onwards. And while using our cells and our body during the life course, during our lifespan, we accumulate damage because we are using our cells. And with the accumulation of damage, we are aging. And now we have measures to measure the biological age. And then we can determine how much the gap is between the chronological age and the biological age. So would the goal then be for us to have better or younger biological age than our chronological age? Yes, that's of course the, the aim. A lower biological age means that the risk of age-related diseases is lower, that the body is functioning in more an optimal stage, and that the health span uh, will be likely be much longer. Singaporeans live longest on Earth, together with wow. populations in Switzerland and with Japan. The life expectancy is roughly 84 years. However, the health span is not getting there. So the health span is 72 years, which means that there's a huge gap between the health span and the lifespan. So how do you measure biological age and what exactly do you look for? The biological age can 
be measured quite easily. For example, by taking a blood sample. We have all the cells in our blood and they give us a number, which is then being determined to be a biological age. We are looking at immune cells, we are looking at white blood cells, we are looking at hormones, we are looking at different measures and that determines the biological age. However, we can also measure the biological age in different organ systems. Think about your heart, your brain, your muscle, your bones, and we can also determine that biological age of a specific organ. And according to Professor Andrea, Singaporeans will soon be able to get their biological age measured at the longevity medicine clinic that the centre is setting up. I guess I got a taste of that already. Time to get my results. Overall, you're doing well. Your biological age is a year older compared to your chronological age. Okay, so not too far apart from the chronological age then. I was a little bit worried there. And what we see in this result that there are a couple of parameters a little bit less optimal than mm. we would expect. There's nothing which we would call the disease, which okay. is important. I was expecting a little worse, to be honest, so I'm taking this as good news. Absolutely, absolutely. In terms of function, you are doing well. Uh, if we are looking at your muscles, they are strong. They can be a little bit more stronger. We are also measuring very small molecules within the skin, okay. which can then lead us, hint us, uh, what the biological age is um, of, of the body. And that was a little bit higher compared to your chronological age. So what are some things that myself or others can do to extend the health span? Most importantly is lifestyle. Enough physical activity, uh, a good diet, and less stress, and a good sleep. And of course, not smoking and not so much alcohol. So these are really the important, important pillars to add healthier years to your life. So you mentioned physical activity is one of the factors that could impact health span. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Being physically active during, during the, the course of the day is very important. But resistance exercise training and also endurance training is also very important. We really have to strengthen our muscles, get the muscle strength and the muscle mass up, and you get that via resistance exercise training. Already from the age of 30 onwards, we are declining in our muscle mass and muscle strength, and we are losing roughly 50% of the muscle mass during our life course until the age of 80. So, and muscle is a very important organ, not only to produce force that we can stand and we can walk and we can talk, but it's also a very important organ for immune function and for other organ systems. So keeping muscles healthy is super important. Endurance training is also very important. What is endurance training? Really getting your heart rate up, a little bit of sweatiness, and really go for it, do that sprint, because then our vessels and our hearts will be much, much healthier in the end. So you mentioned diet as another factor. Can you tell us more about that? Food is very important. Think about the body of your engine, and you have to feed that engine, and you do that with food. So you want the right quantity and the right quality to feed your body. In terms of what we're eating, it's very important to have lots of vegetables, lots of fruit, less meat, mm -hmm. avoiding red meat is very important. We already know that if we would go from a normal diet, the normal population has, to an optimal diet, that the lifespan could be increased by roughly eight to 10 years. But it's not only the quality and what we eat, but also the quantity. A huge number of individuals have obesity around the world, but also in Singapore. And having a healthy weight and not being overweight is very important to keep the body, body healthy. So I know sleep has a lot of positive impacts on our body, especially for our spine, but how does that potentially benefit our health span? Good quality and quantity of sleep is of tremendous influence of your, your body. You should at least sleep eight hours. So eight hours is, is optimal. Seven to nine is, is okay. Sleep is really the resting state of a body where it can repair itself. So that's important. If sleep is too low or too high, that's associated with detrimental outcome. And one of it, for example, cognitive decline mm. and the risk of dementia. People who have had trouble sleeping, stress comes up as one of the most common contributing factors to that. And does that too have an impact on our health span? 
Absolutely. We know that there is a huge interrelation between stressful um, situations and the immune function, but also the heart function, the brain function, etc. So keeping the stress levels down is, uh, is quite important. Okay, so everything you said sounds really doable to me. Let's say I make an effort on all those things. How long could I potentially extend my health span by? It's, of course, dependent on the investment of an individual. How much time do you really want to spend to optimize your health? Mm. Think about five to 10 years, you can lower your biological age, that's doable. Very important is that we can manipulate the body and we can lower the biological age by a couple of years. Wow, knowing what I know now, I feel really motivated to improve my health. Gotta keep that biological age down. Coming up next, a new ambulatory blood pressure monitoring device that helps those with hypertension to maintain their health. Google search will show you that high blood pressure or hypertension is one of the most common chronic diseases among Singaporeans. With hypertension, your heart has to work that much harder to pump blood, and over time, that can lead to serious damage, not only to your blood vessels, but to your organs too. In fact, the number of Singaporeans suffering from hypertension is on the rise. According to National Population Health Survey, in 2017, 13% of Singapore residents aged 18 to 74 suffered from hypertension. In 2021, that number saw quite a jump to 16%. But cardiologists are now able to detect early signs of hypertension using devices like the HealthStats B-Pro. It is an innovative biomonitoring device from HealthStats International, a Singapore-based company founded in 2000. Vencel Gulai heads the company's research and development. This device is a 24-hour blood pressure measurement device, and this is used by medical professionals that will prescribe this device to patients where they want to see a more clear blood pressure pattern over the 24 hours rather than just a few measurements of the day. And after they wear this device, then they take it back to the doctor where the data is downloaded, uh, goes through an algorithm that is generating a report. And after that, the doctor will clearly see at what time of the day the blood pressure changed, at what event could that be, and they will treat the patient accordingly. Does it have to be 24 hours specifically? Can it be a, a little bit more, a little bit less? What is the purpose of the 24 hours? Over a 24 hour, uh, why is it important? Uh, your blood pressure will change according to your daily activities. So when you go to the doctor, they will measure it one time. And when they measure, you may be afraid of doctors. There's, there's a thing called white coat hypertension. You see a white coat and you're scared and your blood, blood pressure will be naturally elevated. And the doctor will say you have hypertension, potentially wrongfully. When you go home, you return to normal levels. So therefore, measuring one time in the doctor's office is not very relevant. Over the course of 24 hours, when you go to office, you talk to your colleagues, uh, your blood pressure may go up or down depending on your colleagues and your relationship with them. Let me show you what do I mean about different patterns in a 24-hour period. So just before you wake up, there's a thing called the morning surge where your blood pressure naturally elevates. Mm -hmm. And when you go to sleep, your blood pressure naturally dips. If you look at the difference between the two charts, you would see that a normal BP, that there's a dip and a, and a different uh, variation in your blood pressure versus a potentially problematic patient would have a totally visually different chart. If for some reason you have elevated risk because you do consume alcohol, you uh, smoke, uh, you have family history, you do have other health conditions that would raise uh, your risk of, of hypertension, then you need to even more carefully track these numbers. So measuring blood pressure is not novel, but how is your device different from the existing blood pressure measurement devices? I'm sure you have used regular blood pressure measurement devices. Uh, 
many times which have a cuff. Uh, they have a tube and they are generally not a small device. The 24-hour version is very similar to this. They may have extra wires or longer tubes which are dangling around your body over that 24-hour period, which makes it not very comfortable. Uh, this device is, is just that, that's what all you're wearing for the 24-hour period, which is very sleek design and it's not intrusive in your normal lifestyle. As well as our device is clinically validated and certified by local and overseas regulatory bodies. So now I'm curious, how exactly does the device work? So when you go to the doctor's office, a trained professional will do the following steps. Uh, number one, uh, they will feel the pulse on your wrist, which is the best point to put the device on. You have to find the strongest pulse point, and that's where the device can comfortably measure. And then they would stick this sticker with this piece uh, on it, and the device itself is going to fit very nicely like a Lego piece into it, and make sure that it's very well secured and not going to move over the 24-hour period even when you shower. So the next step would be to start the measurement, but in a clinical setting, uh, before that, we would uh, measure your actual blood pressure, which number would be inputted into the device as a base number. So now it's connecting your base blood pressure to your waveform. So on the screen, what you can see now is your arterial pressure waveform and that is being stored in the device as your calibration measurement. So what are some things I should take note of while wearing this during the 24-hour period? When you're wearing the device over a 24-hour period, uh, it's gonna capture your waveform every 15 minutes. Uh, and when it's doing that, it's gonna beep for you that you should stay still. Okay. After you shower, when you go to bed, just make sure that you're not pressing on the sensor with anything. And it's not going to beep from midnight to 6 a.m. So obviously a great device, but right now it's only being passed out by cardiologists or medical professionals. Do you ever see a future where this can be a consumer product like a smartwatch which you can purchase over the counter? Definitely we do envision, although there are a lot of technical challenges that we have to solve first. As I showed you, uh, it has to be applied very, very specifically, which, which may be uh, problematic for an older patient uh, or consumer uh, product should not be this difficult to apply, right? So once we solve those, we definitely see that it would make sense to make it uh, a consumer device. Well, as far as I know, I don't have hypertension. But it's good to know that there are innovations out there to help us keep a close eye on our health. Next up, <laughs> we're asking the expert how laughter could give you a cardio workout. <laughs> oh, hey, we're back. As they say, laughter is the best medicine. And it's not just the same. In fact, laughter could be equal to a cardio workout. But don't just take it from me. Let's ask the expert. Dr. Devinder Singh is a cardiologist, and he has studied how laughter may be as good as exercise. So what is it that happens when we have a good hearty laugh? When we laugh, almost every organ system of the body is involved. The prominent system being involved is musculoskeletal system, respiratory system, cardiovascular system, and nervous system. If we talk about musculoskeletal system, within 10 seconds of our laugh, almost 15 facial muscles are involved. And I can show you this picture and one of the muscles called zygomaticus major, as you can see here, leads to the outward and upward movement of angle of your mouth. And all these muscles are active, which is very prominent when you laugh. But not only these muscles, muscles of the neck, muscles of your thorax and abdomen are involved in a hearty laughter. The heart rate goes up as well as cardiac output goes up. Cardiac output means the heart contracts stronger. The nervous system is involved, it causes release of endorphin that makes you feel better. And our respiratory system is involved because we start breathing faster 
and our lung capacity increases. So I've been told that laughter can be equated to a good cardio workout, but how does it compare? During cardiac workout, your heart rate increases and uh, your musculoskeletal system is active. So energy expenditure as well as oxygen con consumption increases exponentially. So when you are running, jogging, high intensity interval training, this is how you lose calories during cardiac workout. Similar to cardiac exercise, when you have a hearty laughter, you are using your musculoskeletal system, your heart rate goes up. And in fact, studies have shown that during laughter of about 15 minutes a day, your energy expenditure goes up by 20% compared to your resting state. And it can lead to 10 to 40 kilocalories expenditure in a day. And just to put things into perspective, if you uh, laugh every day for 15 minutes, it can translate to a weight loss of one to two kg in a year. Wow. So just to clarify though, when you say 15 minutes, you mean 15 minutes throughout the day, right? Not like at a single sitting? Correct. So it can be in five minutes bout, don't have to be continuous 15 minutes okay. of laughter. We've always been told though that cardio workouts are great for our heart. Uh, does laughter have the same impact on our heart health? Yes, laughter has beneficial effect on your cardiovascular system. And in fact, when you laugh, there is a release of this hormone called endorphin, which is actually a happy chemical. And endorphin leads to release of this messenger molecule called nitric oxide from your blood vessels that can lead to increase in size of blood vessel called vasodilatation that improves blood flow to the not only cardiovascular system but other parts of your body. And laughter is also a stress buster. We know that stress is an adverse cardiovascular risk factor and can lead to heart problems like a heart attack. So when we laugh, it does reduces our stress level as well. So you sold me on this, but now I'm curious, how do we practice laughter as a form of exercise? Well, laughter is the best medicine, although I can't write a prescription for to you, but I will uh, definitely say that we should make effort to laugh at least 10 to 15 minutes a day. You should watch a comedy movie, you can watch a comedy show, you can go out, socialize with your friends. In our stressful life, we sometimes forget that you know we do have to de-stress and laugh. <laughs> and I can't stress more about it. You could have a stash of joke books or riddles or things that make you laugh. So, why do bees have sticky hair? It's because they use honeycombs, of course. <laughs> well, that's my contribution to your cardio for the day. I hope you've enjoyed watching this series of On The Pulse. Keep laughing and stay healthy.